Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today, we are very uh, lucky to have Dr. Even Alexander, and he's going to be talking about his book, Proof of Heaven. And um, for those of you who may not know Dr. Even Alexander, I think a lot of people are familiar with your book since it's a New York Times bestseller. He was a renowned uh, neurosurgeon and went to my alma mater, Duke, for medical school and uh, UNC, which we won't talk about here. Um, <laughs> And um, he was a neurosurgeon and uh, was understanding um, the brain um, and consciousness from that perspective. And he had a near-death experience from E. coli, men e. coli bacterial meningitis. And, uh, and through that near-death experience, it's really, um, I assume, changed your life and uh and and how he experiences life and what he's learned about life itself so we're going to learn all about that so welcome dr alexander thanks for having me it's great to be here so uh i want to first start off with consciousness and um, what your discoveries uh were when you're um, on your you call it an adventure your near-death experience as an adventure and it actually, when you read the book, uh, Proof of Heaven, it does sound like an adventure, but you um, uh, described it as something that was very important for not only our own understanding, but also scientific understanding. So I wanted to first start off with consciousness, and um, you've been studying this for a while, the last eight years. What's your understanding of consciousness? What is it? Well, I think consciousness in its purest sense is that awareness that we have, that we exist. Mm -hmm. You know, as Rene Descartes said, uh, I think, therefore I am. And it's that awareness of existence that is actually such a deep mystery. And mm -hmm. the science that I had studied uh, so rigorously for all of those decades as a neurosurgeon uh, before my coma, which occurred back in November of 2008, that science, uh, which I would call conventional neuroscience, very clearly says the physical brain creates consciousness out of physical matter, the substance mm -hmm. of the brain. And what my journey showed me very clearly, and this is largely because of the fact that I had gram-negative bacterial meningitis, a very severe form of the worst kind of meningitis you can have. Uh, it's pretty much uniformly fatal to have that severe disease as I had, and it drove me into coma within a few hours wow. uh, and left me there for a week. Uh, by the end of that week, my doctors uh, had pretty much given up hope. They thought I had a 2% chance of survival, and if I was going to be in that lucky 2%, what that really meant was coming back uh, uh, to this world only uh, in coma. Uh, not really ever waking up and going to a nursing home and then finally dying there a few months later. And that's why my doctors were recommending uh, that um, they discontinue antibiotics and let nature take its course. Now, the reason it's so important, the diagnosis, is it's such a perfect model for human death. Uh, meningitis attacks the outer surface of the brain, the neocortex, and all of our conventional neuroscientific ideas of consciousness uh, very clearly stipulate that the neocortex must be involved. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it may not be the primary generator of consciousness, for any kind of detailed conscious awareness, you've got to have some parts of that neocortex functioning. My doctors knew perfectly well that my neocortex was very badly damaged. Tell, for, people who are, for people who aren't familiar with the neocortex, tell us what is the function of that part. Well, it's really the outer surface of the brain and everything that you ever experience as a human being, uh, everything you see, everything you hear, all of your kind of rational, logical thinking, um, everything about how we see our body in relation to things around us, etc., demands certain parts of that neocortex be functioning. Mm, okay. That's what I'm saying is the, the details of conscious awareness um, depend heavily on that neocortex. And that's why, to me, it was such a gigantic shock yeah. deep in this coma that as my disease was progressing and my neocortex was being destroyed, in fact, what I was witnessing was a far a greater uh, enhancement of consciousness. It was completely uh, elevated out of the, the false little sense of a here and now. Um, and that is a very, very difficult thing to explain, the ultra-reality, the, the way of knowing in that realm that, that uh, far transcends 
uh, the little trickle of conscious awareness that we have in these physical bodies. And that's why people often describe near-death experiences as this mind-blowing overdose of ultra-real phenomena and experience all the way to becoming one with the universe throughout all of eternity. I mean, it's these things really lose all kind of conceptual conveyance in our language because our language was uh, basically evolved to allow us to describe earthly events to each other. Mm -hmm. And our language is not at all well suited to describing such otherworldly journeys, especially when our very consciousness is altered and we get this extreme overflow of information. Yeah. Uh, and that's why it was so hard to explain. And of course, the gift was that I had this severe um, meningitis that had destroyed my neocortex, which completely violated everything that our conventional neuroscience says about the neocortex and how consciousness is created. But what it showed me very clearly is the physical brain does not create consciousness at all. And that is a very important observation. In fact, this is where all of the scientific world on this question is headed, is a realization that we have to think much bigger. We have to expand our notion of the nature of reality and realize that consciousness is actually fundamental. And mm -hmm. it is what creates all of the world that unfolds around us. In fact, the illusion, uh, you know, before my coma as a practicing neurosurgeon, I thought, well, the physical world is all that exists. The illusion is consciousness, but I had it backwards. Mm. And this has to do with a very mind-body discussion that's been going on, um, you know, for at least 2,400 years about the relationship of, of the brain and the mind and how the one interacts and may create the other. And what it points out is that our science, that conventional neuroscience, just has it completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And the, there's a very... Uh, major piece of evidence in our science in that there's something called the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, and when you get deeply into that, you start to realize that our materialist science has absolutely nothing whatsoever to say about how the physical brain might create consciousness. And that's a tremendous clue as to the nature of the problem. The problem is that consciousness is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And consciousness is what actually creates all the rest of this, including the physical realm and everything that we see around us. So it's a complete uh, uh, reversal of like how yeah. we really should think about. It. And it's funny because I read what you wrote and then I was explaining um, to uh, my husband this morning. We we're walking and I said, oh, yeah, here's what this book is about. And I said, wait a second. Like I, I read it. And because it was so contrary to the way that I think I've been trained to think about it, I fast forwarded past it. And so just for the, in the interest of the audience, just in case they did the same thing, because it, it is pretty mind blowing. Like what you just said is, you know, gigantic, which is that I always thought that even when I'm meditating, right, that when I'm tapping into something greater, I'm doing that through my brain, through my body. I'm like, I'm, it's something in my brain that's actually helping create the physical sensations, the visions, the memories. And what I'm hearing you say is it has nothing to do with your brain. I mean, when you're tapping into something greater, it's not through your brain, which is, well, just, is, is that what you said? Is that what you meant would, to say? I is wouldn't that... say it has nothing to do with the brain. The big mistake is thinking the brain as a physical system mm -hmm. is creating consciousness out of its physical constituents. That's the mistake. And in fact, that has never led anywhere. The better scientific version for a model that is emerging today um, is called filter theory, which is mm -hmm. basically that the brain serves as a filter uh, or reducing valve that limits primordial consciousness down to this tiny little trickle of the apparent here and now of what we exist. So in other words, don't look at the brain as the creator but it's more like a transceiver, or I think a better word is filter. Receiver or filter. Yeah, it, it simply uh, allows conscious awareness to manifest down in this realm. In this, uh, because things like time and space are themselves illusory constructs of that consciousness. And it's reading it all out of uh, you know, an informational system, but it's not the physical universe as an objective reality that scientific revolution has been looking for for the last 400 years 
Um, so it's, it's a, a very different way of looking at conscious awareness and what it is, but it completely opens the door uh, to the reality of the kind of experiences that people describe by the tens of thousands in near-death experiences, shared death experiences, mm -hmm. after-death communications, past life memories in children indicative of reincarnation. I mean, there's a tremendous category of kind of conscious experience that is extraordinary and, and defies all of our conventional models. But in fact, it's at those edges that you actually are able to make the most progress in understanding the mundane aspects of consciousness. Because I promise you, the biggest mystery of all is not what I went through and, and others by the millions have gone through with these spiritually transformative experiences, even though, yes, those are quite interesting and mysterious. The deep mystery and the real mystery of it all remains the nature of consciousness itself. And that is where I think many scientists are rising to... Um, to the challenge here are uh, they who are these scientists because i've talked to some people and, and it seems like most scientists are incredulous so no, who are I the would... science ri rising to the occasion and what are they studying well i can give you two incredibly okay, good. powerful resources two books that are very very good about all this they yeah. are deep and tough and challenging they are not for the general reader or the uh, okay the, about the for investigator these things are very deep one book, I talk about this book in Proof of Heaven, uh, it's called Irreducible Mind Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century. Mm -hmm. It was uh, edited by uh, Ed Kelly, Emily Williams Kelly, Bruce Grayson, and others out of the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. It's listed on my website if people go to ebonalexander.com. Uh, there's a reading list on there, and at the very top of that reading list is the book of the century, uh, and that's Irreducible Mind. Normally, I have the book of the month up there, but... Right. Right now, it's the book of the century, um, is actually the sequel to that book, because mm -hmm. that book came out in 2007. That book was very important to me in helping me understand my journey, and it's a very scientific work mm -hmm. on every bit of this. Mm. But it takes, the problem is, the materialist science that I used to worship before my coma, you know, the pure physicalism, right. that the physical is the only thing that exists, that is the very shallow end of the pool. That is kindergarten. Hmm. That has nothing to do with the really deep, profound notions of reality uh, that you will find if you read a book like Irreducible Mind. And the second book to mention is from the same group. Uh, and that book just came out in February of, of uh, last year, just about a year ago. Uh, and that book is called Beyond Physicalism Toward Reconciliation of Science and Spirituality. Again, the lead uh, editor there is Ed Kelly. Uh, and and others from the Esalen Institute and from the University of Virginia uh, Division of Perceptual Studies. They um, are really one of the world leaders in this kind of understanding hmm. of the nature of consciousness, how it, it leaves uh, that simplistic and false model of brain creates consciousness, which is the conventional uh, kind of materialist right. scientific view of reality, uh, leaves that far in the dust. Uh, we're no longer in the shallow end of the pool, though, and that's why I'm warning people. Those right. are very, very deep reads, but they are also well worth it for the true seeker. Uh, they get very deeply into the nature of reality. Do not deny all the evidence that's been out there. For example, um, you know, the conventional neuroscientific assessment of near-death experiences is some... Uh, very um, minimal discussion around oxygen tension in the brain mm -hmm. and some ideas about carbon dioxide and, and how you can maybe release a DMT or mm -hmm. uh, use ketamine to mimic these experiences, etc. Uh, but they don't remotely come into the ballpark of being able to explain the full-blown nature of uh, the majority of these kind of experiences. Okay. So it takes a completely new <laughs> mindset to begin. To okay, I have to read that book, but you said something that was also mind blowing. You said, you know, we think that it's, it's, um, that consciousness is something that, you know, the brain creates. Um, now we're realizing that consciousness is the seed of the foundation of everything. What the heck did that mean? <laughs> I, I, well, I can tell you a, a lot of what it means. Uh, first of all, important to point out that the brain and mind uh, pull off one of the most amazing and shocking tricks imaginable. 
Uh, and that is that all of the out there, when I look out the window and I see the mountains and the clouds and the trees, everything around me in this uh, home that I'm sitting in and all of that, and, and we're tricked into believing that what we're experiencing is all of the stuff out there, but we're not. What we're experiencing is an internal model, a construct within mind that is supposed to represent all the stuff that is out there, but you're not having a direct experience of the stuff out there at all. Hmm. What you're experiencing, like when light comes in and hits my uh, eye and the, and the retina and then goes through pathways of the brain, transferring the information to me, what I'm experiencing is the final product of that that is put together in consciousness. And yes, there is a certain amount of fidelity of the model within mm -hmm. mind to what is out there, but the mistake is in believing that what is out there is what you're experiencing because you're right. not. Well, and that is a crucial part of this. This uh, is why, uh, you know, there's so much work in psychology to show um, how many things are illusory, how you can create visual hallucinations. You can also trick the um, nervous system into kind of using visual because it usually defaults to visual as the most important source of information. But you can have all kinds of optical illusions that have to do with other um, modes of, of sensory perception interfering with uh, vision in such a way where they may be bringing in the better information, but the visual system seems to trump it. But then it gets much deeper because when you really get down to it, the deepest mystery that we uncover as we investigate this modeling of the external world uh, in the brain uh, is what we find in the whole world of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, the whole reason mm. they tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the measurement problem itself very specifically points out uh, that the conscious observer is absolutely essential at creating anything that emerges into reality as an observation about the world. Mm -hmm. And the very, uh, when you get into the very deep essence of quantum physics and what it's trying to tell us about that, what it is really showing us is that consciousness is fundamental. That consciousness is what exists and then paints this picture of reality. The brain and mind and consciousness fool us into thinking that all the out there is out there. But never forget, it is truly a model within the mind. And it's in that very fine discussion about the relationship of what may be out there with the internal representation of it uh, that is of great interest. But, but don't be fooled into believing that what is out there is as it appears. Do, do, uh, you, ever, do you ever wonder why God, or whatever you want to call this greater entity, created a model like this. It seems like a design flaw <laughs> that our brain no, was created this way. Fact, I would say, in fact, it's very well designed to, I'm sorry, I'm having to rotate my camera a bit. The but light is shining well, on you. <laughs> the thing to remember from my point of view yeah. is the th this world that we live in, our four-dimensional space-time where we come in, incarnate in these physical forms is beautifully designed to serve as a stage on which the drama of sentient beings in all of their interactions and in all their learning and teaching of, of lessons and understanding of the workings of the universe can play out these roles. This is where we face those hardships and difficulties. When I came back from my coma, it was very clear to me that the challenges in life, the hardships, and certainly as a doctor, I'll tell you that includes illness and injury, uh, that those are gifts. They are there for a reason. Those are the stepping stones. They are the engines of growth of the soul. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.